Welcome everyone to Grace Online. My name is Logan Hall and I'm the Associate Young Adults Pastor here at our church. And I'm honored to be one of the first to welcome you all to Grace Community Church. We are one church in two physical locations right here in Sarasota, Florida. And we stream our services every weekend in order to help you find God's direction for your life and to grow in your walk with Jesus. In just a minute or two, we're gonna be doing that together through powerful songs of worship through fellowship and community via the live chat, and through world-class Bible-based teaching and preaching. So get excited with me because we will be getting started with service in just a few short moments. But but before we begin, we want to share an awesome opportunity that's available for everyone, including our online family. Here at our church, we truly believe that church is more than just an event to attend, but it's a people to connect with. And one specific way that we're highlighting that is this weekend is through what we call Grace Groups. We have a ton of groups from smaller groups to larger groups, and they're all specifically designed to help people connect with others, to grow in their walks with Jesus, and also to go out and be intentional neighbors in their community. And so for all of you at home, we want to invite you to go to our website, gracesarasota.com, and go to the Grace Groups under the Connect tab and take a look at many of the options and consider joining a group that interests you. If you live here in Sarasota, there really are tons of groups available for you. And if you live far away or maybe you can't join a physical group, we've also added numerous online and virtual groups as well. So again, make sure that you visit our website and check those out today. But all that being said, it's about time for our services to begin. So no matter who you are or where you are right now, I hope that you're really able to focus on Jesus in this time. His presence isn't confined to any one room or specific building, but in an amazing way, we believe that Jesus is with you and me right now as we lift up his name and sing his praises. So I really encourage you to join the Grace Worship Team as they lead us in whatever way you feel comfortable at home. But from all of us here at our church, thanks for being here. And welcome to Grace. Community Church, would you stand with us and worship today? When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. surrounds me There's nothing to fear now for I'm safe with you So when I fight I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high Oh God the battle belongs to you Battle B. Be- 
shine in the shadows you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our god almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our god you shine in the shadows you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our god almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our god you shine in the shadows you win
Before we continue in worship, I want to take a quick moment to welcome those of you just tuning in. My name is Logan Hall, and I'm the Associate Young Adults Pastor here at Grace, and we are so glad to have you all with us online today. And as an extra special shout out, we really want to acknowledge any of you who are joining us this weekend as a new guest. If that's you, feel free to say hey in the chat below. Or more importantly, we would really love to connect with you as well. You can either visit our website at gracesarasota.com and click the I'm new button. Or you can text the phrase new guest SRQ with no spaces and you can text that to the number 97000. Both of those things will bring you to our digital connect card, which is just a quick and simple way for us to get to know a little bit about you so that we can then connect with you. We can be praying for you and we'll also send you a free gift. Plus, it will allow us to plan a future visit that you can come to either of our two campuses here in Sarasota. So please check those things out. But the most important thing that we want you to know is that we really are so glad that you're here. So welcome. Now, really quick, in case you missed the beginning of today's service, we mentioned that there are many ways for you to get connected here at Grace that go beyond our weekend services. And one of those ways for you to get connected is through our Grace groups. There truly are tons of groups which are designed to help you connect with others, grow in your walk with Christ, and to go out and be intentional neighbors. And so if you live here in Sarasota, there really are numerous groups available for you. And if you aren't able to join an in-person group, we've also added quite a few online groups as well. Now, as many of you know, we exist here at Grace to reach the unchurched by being intentional neighbors who reflect Christ. And in light of that, let's check out this short video. The Grace Life Food Pantry, we're more than just a food pantry. We consider ourselves a ministry. There are a lot of broken people out there who struggle with many things, and a big need is putting food on their table. They have to humble themselves and ask for help, and we are there to walk alongside them, to lift them up, to pray with them, to provide food, to feed their, their children, their parents. Grace Community has offered to purchase 9,000 pounds of food per week. That entails providing food for at least 500 families a week. It's just more than a bag of food or a box of food. It's that relationship building and that care and that gentleness that they need right now when times are really tough. Grace Life and the Nightlife Center would like to thank Grace Community for partnering with us. You have impacted our pantry tremendously by your giving and your generosity. There's so many people that are so humbled and grateful. So thank you so very much. Isn't that amazing? It's so awesome to see how God is using this church to continue to make a difference in people's lives. So thank you, Grace, for allowing God to use you. Through your giving and generosity, you're allowing God to use you to reach people and make a kingdom impact in our community. And if you would like to be a part of what God is doing here in this church, we want to give you an opportunity to give as well. Like we say almost every week, we believe that giving isn't just something that God wants from you and me, but giving is something that God wants for you and me. So we wanna invite you and challenge you to worship the Lord through giving this weekend. You can give here at Grace in many different ways. So make sure that you take a look at the bottom of the screen or you can hit the link that's available in the chat. But once again, thank you to everyone for being such a generous church. Would you pray with me as we take a moment to ask God to bless this week's offering? Father God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for giving us all of the blessings and the many gifts that you've given us. And God, as we, give, as we give it back to you, I pray that you bless the offering, that you multiply our giving, that because of the giving of Grace Community Church, people come to know Jesus. Father, we love you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now let's all continue to sing with the Grace Worship Team. Help my unbelief, I 
choose to trust you no matter what i feel let faith rise let faith rise for my champion's not dead he is alive oh and he already knows my every So surely he will come and rescue me. Mm. God of miracles, come. We need your supernatural love to break through. Nothing's impossible. You're the in this place oh we're needing a breakthrough we need a touch from you God Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And the church said, amen. Silent. 
silencing my every fear, silencing my every fear. Sing, I believe, I believe in you, I believe in you, you're the God of miracles. I believe in you, I believe in you, you're the God of miracles. If there's ever a time that the church has needed to believe that God is the God of miracles, it would be today. Do we believe that God can still do the miraculous? Do we believe that, right? We do believe that. 
And so what I want us to do, if we, if we could, I, I, I want us to just take a moment and I want us to pray. We have much to pray for. Um, we're, we're opening up the church regularly now on Wednesdays from six to eight, we're trying to transfer back and forth to the campuses. But I just believe that God's people need to pray. And um, I don't know what your need is this evening. I don't know what your need is um, online, um, whatever, whatever it may be. I just want you to know that you're not here. You didn't tune in by accident. You're here because God wanted to meet you here. And he's just a prayer of faith away. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me? Those online as well. And let's just take a moment here. Father, we come to you because we are, um, we're people that are, are, are needy. We're, we're many people <clears throat> during this season are weary and tired and afflicted and, 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 and wondering. And Lord, Lord, I just pray that as you said in Matthew 11, you said that if you're tired, if you're weary, if you're heavy laden, Lord, you invited us to come to you and you said you would give us rest. Lord, we come to you right now this weekend. We come to you and we say that we need you in our lives. We need your rest. We need your peace. Lord, we need you to do the miraculous. Lord, we look around our world and we realize how ravaged our world is, whether it be the things going on overseas, whether it be things here in the United States, whether it be a hurricane getting ready probably to hit somewhere in Louisiana. We look around and we realize, God, we need you to move. Father, we pause right now as your people and say that we believe that you are the God who created the heavens and the earth. We believe that you are the God who can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. We believe that you are the God that rose from the dead on the third day. We believe that you are the God that can walk on the sea. We believe that you are the God that can split the Red Sea for the children of Israel to walk through. Lord, we believe that you opened the eyes of the blind and you opened the ears of those that were deaf. You made those who could not walk, walk again. Nothing is too difficult for you. So Lord, we call out to you with our own needs, our own things that we're going through and, and the problems and pains of this world. And we ask, Father, that you would invade this world once again, that the kingdom of God would show forth strong. Lord, that, that, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done for your glory and for your glory alone. And Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap and <clears throat> go ahead and have a seat? A couple things real quick that I wanna say. Uh, um, I just wanna brag real briefly on Mike Kaysen, who uh, did a fantastic job last, last weekend. Um, didn't have a whole lot of time to put that together, uh, but I am, I am grateful here at Grace Community Church that we have um, a number of young men and young women that are coming up that are going to serve this church for many, many years to come. And uh, it's, uh, it's just, uh, it's fantastic to know that God is raising these, this next generation up to do um, great things. So uh, if you see Mike, please make sure you tell him what a great job that he did because, because he did. Well, let's get to work here and get back into Galatians. One of the questions I get asked um, regularly is, Chip, can we really know what the early church was about? Like, can we really know what was going on back then? And, and it, that, that question's predicated on a lot of disinformation that's out there in the world of social media, blogs, YouTube, and so on and so forth, that somehow the, the gospels and the letters that we're reading in the New Testament are so far removed from what originally happened in the early church. So therefore, what we've got is sort of this distortion and this, 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 the, the church is sort of reworking certain things into the gospels, into the epistles that we, that we have. And I would like to just say that that's, that's just not the case. Um, the, the, the gospels and the epistles that we have are not so far removed. In fact, we're looking at this epistle that Paul wrote to the church at Galatia. And many people feel that this is the earliest book in the New Testament. Oftentimes, 1 Thessalonians or James sometimes are proffered up, but many people feel Galatians is the earliest book in the New Testament. This is, this is as early as it gets. And if you, if you run on the theory that the Jerusalem Council was somewhere between 48 AD, maybe even up to 50 AD, we're not, we're not, we're not precise 
But if you run with that two-year variance, then, then you know if Paul wrote this before the Jerusalem Council, which I believe that he did, um, then you're looking at a book that could be written as early as 48 AD. So this is, this is a really early um, epistle. And so we're gonna learn a lot as we go through this. Now, if you were not here a couple of weeks ago, I would highly recommend that you go back and rewatch the introduction to this particular epistle. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff. It's probably more stuff than I should have put in a message, but that's just the way it is. I didn't wanna spend a whole lot of time doing the intro, so we, we looked at that. And suffice to say, the most important thing that we get for this, this weekend is that Paul had visited the, the area in what we would call today Southern Turkey, and he had planted um, multiple places of Christianity, multiple churches in different parts of that region, and he had left. And then some other people had come in and said, hey, what Paul taught, yeah, it, it really wasn't the full gospel. Paul's sort of a people pleaser. He doesn't like to tell you the full deal. You know, I mean, the gospel's a little bit rougher than the way he makes it. And, and so we need to come in and tell you the rest of the story, so to speak. And Paul hears and gets wind of this and he writes this epistle. So as we go into this, this is early Paul. This is early Christianity. This is early working it out. And I think we're gonna enjoy it very, very much. Now, every sermon will start with, the title will have a chapter and the verses so that when you go back online or you go back um, on the mobile app, if you're reading in Galatians a year from now, two years from now, and you're in chapter three and you're looking at a verse and wondering, you'll be able to go back and catalog. We also are highly considering transcribing all of the messages and making a commentary on Galatians to, to, to be read. So um, we're trying to do this so that you can have the, the scriptures at, at your, uh, um, you know, that you can get to scripture best that you can to learn it. So let's, let's get to work and uh, let's, let's gonna go, we're gonna go line by line and, and we're only gonna get through five verses this weekend um, and we'll get through it in just a few hours. So it'll be, be good and y'all can still get something to, uh, <clears throat> just kidding. So let's, let's, uh, let, let's, let's get to work. So Verse one of chapter one of this epistle starts off, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, most of us, if we're being honest, probably when we read that, we're on to the next verse. I, I wanna try to help us to really take some time and realize there's not one word in any of these books that we read in the Bible that's just happenstance. There's not surplus wordage, so to speak. They're super important the way they're put together. So the first thing that we realize is, is he starts off with Paul, which is different from you and me. When we write a letter today, we say to whom it may concern or to whoever it is that we're writing to, then we write the letter and at the very end we say, sincerely, Chip. Okay, in the first century, they didn't do it that way. They started with the person who wrote the letter. Paul, we know about him. We know about his journeys. We know about his missionary journeys. We know a lot about Paul just from the New Testament. Um, there's some recorded stuff about Paul as a person that we can't say for sure, but, but the word Paul itself means little or it means modest. And so Paul was probably a very short statured man. We see this in the Corinthian correspondence where they say, when he's in front of you in physical, he's not very impressive. So he probably was a short man. There's, we, have a, we have a little sort of detailed about Paul that we can't say is completely true, but it said Paul was short, that he had a crooked nose, and that his eyebrows met. So Paul had the first unibrow, um, you know, and, uh, but, 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 the, but the reality is, is Paul was probably a very short man, nothing really to look at, and he writes this letter. He says, Paul, and is in all of his epistles, he reminds us, except for Philemon, who's written to a friend to try to um, re release a slave. <clears throat> he tells us that he's an apostle. Why does he do that? Why does he tell us that he's an apostle? What, what's, what's, the, what's the reasoning for Paul letting us know in his epistles that he's an apostle? Well, what it does is it says that he has the authority to speak into the life of, of the church. Imagine if the church never had anybody that could speak to it. We would be like the book of Judges where everybody did what was right in their own sight. Everybody just sort of did what they wanted to do. Paul says, hey, I'm an apostle because I'm getting ready to write 
you something because there needs to be some correction. And anytime he writes, he always lets you know he's an apostle because he's writing to a church that needs correction. Why can he be the one that tells them, hey, you need to sort of not do this and you need to start doing this because he's an apostle. Now, what he does here in this epistle that he doesn't do in any other epistle is he starts off after saying that he's an apostle and he goes what we would consider to be some negative things. He says, he says something, instead of just saying, I'm an apostle called by God or by the will of God, he says this. He says, not from men nor through man. Why does he say that? Why does he stop and pause and, and let them know that, hey, by the way, my apostleship, yeah, it's not from men. It wasn't like a bunch of men decided that I was gonna be an apostle, nor is it through man. Well, probably what's going on is the people that came into the region after Paul had left said things like this. Paul, yeah, he's not really an apostle because he didn't walk with Jesus. See, he was set forth by people. We have that in Acts 13, where the church at Antioch set Paul and Barnabas forth as missionaries, as apostles. And so these people that came in after Paul probably said, yeah, you know, he, he says a lot of things and it sounds impressive and it, and it, and it feels good, but he's probably not to be regarded on the same level is the, is the real apostles, which is why he sort of takes this defensive posture at the very beginning to say, hey, my apostleship, yeah, it wasn't from men. Like just in case you heard that, in case, in case somebody came and told you that I'm not the real deal, let, let, me, let me go ahead and dispel that. And it's nor through man. My apostleship is for real. And I have the ability to speak into the church because my apostleship didn't come from man at all. And then what he does next is shocking for early Christianity, especially if this is the first epistle, the first piece of literature that we have in the New Testament. And this is coming from a monotheistic Jew who understood the scriptures, who was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Look at what he does. And oftentimes we breeze through this and don't pay attention to it. Look at what he does here. He says, he's an apostle, not from men nor through men. Look at this, but through Jesus. He puts Jesus before he places God the Father. That is striking. You, people say, well, you know, the early church didn't really consider Jesus to be God or they didn't consider Jesus to be something special. This may very well be the first piece of literature that we have in the New Testament. And Paul has put Jesus in the primary place to support his apostleship. This is the, the Christological significance of this cannot be understated. He says, my apostleship, it's not from men nor through men, but it's through Jesus and God the Father. Now, this is really important here. Hold on, do we just lose the, can we? Go back, maybe, did it die? It may have died. If it died, we're gonna try to do what Jesus did for Lazarus. <laughs> and we're gonna try to resurrect it, there we go. So we got God the Father here. So notice here what's gone on. I wanna stop here because what I'm gonna do periodically in this text is <clears throat> so I'm not gonna just give us the background and the theological stuff. I'm gonna also try to make some real practical applications. So Paul is convinced that he's speaking into the life of the church. And, and I want us to just stop for a minute here and think about this because this is important. Do you, do we have anybody in our life? I want you to be honest with yourself. You don't have to tell anybody, you don't have to look to your neighbor or say anything like that. I just want you to be honest with yourself for saying, that can speak directly to us that we would listen to, even if they were telling us that they disagreed. Is there anybody in your life that can speak into your life right now 
that could say to you, hey, I think what you're doing or what you're saying or what you're thinking might be wrong, that you would stop and you would seriously consider what they said to you? Now, I know there's a lot of recoiling because here in America, we're these radical individualists, but the church and, and the Bible is not written in that way. The Bible is written that we need people in our lives. And I know many of you may have grown up in a tr tradition like I did where this was abused. I had people that abused spiritual authority and you know, said things that, and, and they did it to control and manipulate and all that stuff. That's not biblical. It, we shouldn't throw it out because it's, we've had some bad experiences. I mean, First Peter 5 says that people that are over us should, should do it as an example and should do it as a servant you know, and, and all of those good things. But I, but I, I wanna ask this question because this is, this is a question. Who do you have in your life? Who do we have in our life like Paul who could directly speak into our life that would put us on the dime, that would read our mail and would make us pause for a moment? I always say it this way, everybody needs a pastor in their life. Everybody needs somebody in their life that they can say, hey, I believe this person is a godly person I believe this person really cares about my interests. And I believe that if they spoke to me and told me something, it would be something that I would need to really go home and think about and pray about. If you don't have somebody in your life like that, I can tell you that usually sets us up as Christians for bad things. We see it in the aggregate in, in, the, in the larger church when pastors, people like me, get way out of line and, and, and when you go back and you ask, why does that happen? Typically, it's because they didn't have anybody in their life that could read their mail. They couldn't, somebody couldn't pick up the phone and say, hey, what you're teaching this, this weekend, that was crazy, man. We need to have like a cup of coffee and, and talk about that. Hey, the way you're treating your wife, it's just not acceptable, man. You kids, you need, to, you need to go home and spend a little bit more time with the kids. Like, who do we have in our lives? Because Paul is convinced that the church needs people in the church that can speak into the church. In fact, in Ephesians 4, he says that God put apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. If we don't have people in our lives that can read our mail, it's very easy to get off very quickly. Just something to think about, something to pray about, something to just let, let the Lord work with you about. So Paul says, He's an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. And then listen to what he says. Of all the things that he could have said, especially if this is the first piece of literature that we have in the New Testament, what does he lead with? That the Father raised him from the dead. Like the one thing Paul knew that made Christianity Christianity was the fact that Jesus got up on the third day. That was, that we, we, in, in Latin, there's a term called sine qua non. It's the not without which. In other words, you can't have whatever it is that you have without this. You can't play basketball without a basketball. You can't play football without a football. You cannot have, we cannot have Christianity without the resurrection. Resurrection is the not without which Christianity doesn't exist. And this is so important because right here in verse one, of all the things Paul could say, he, he, he lays it right out there that Jesus has been risen <clears throat> from the dead. This is so important because we have to start thinking, what is our faith? What is your faith based on? Is it based on a checklist? Is it based on a creed? Is it based on a system? Is it based on a theological doctrinal commitment? What's it based on? Because the earliest Christians would tell you that Christianity is based on a person who, raised, who was raised from the dead. Alistair Begg says it this way. Alistair Begg says, if when we talk about what is our faith based on, if we use first person, we're in trouble. I believed. I did this. I lived this way. He says, that's not the appropriate response. The appropriate response is the third person. He died for me. He rose again on the third day. He forgave my sins. What's our faith based on? Is it based on all kinds of other stuff or is it based on the truth of the fact that Jesus rose from the dead? So Paul says he's an apostle and it's not from or through men. And he is, he is, he's, he's called of God because Jesus and God the Father have called him. 
and Jesus has been risen from the dead. And he says, to all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. He probably would have just blown through that. It's okay. But there's a lot in here that's important. First of all, he uses this word brothers. This is, this is important. Paul is saying, hey, I want you to know that what I'm teaching you and what I'm saying to you is not something that's coming from me alone. There are a lot of other people that are in this thing with me, which is so important because Paul articulates here, he's not alone in his understanding. Listening and doing theology with others is vital. We forget, it's so easy for us to forget as Christians that Christianity is not an individual sport. It's a team sport. The Lord's prayer is not my father, which art in heaven. It's our father, which art in heaven. We tend to forget that most of the you's in the New Testament, when we read, you were saved and you were saved, we go, oh, that's great. No, most of the you's in the New Testament are plural, which means the church, like when he says to the Philippian church, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We typically read that as, okay, I gotta work out my salvation as true. No, what he's saying is, is the church, the church at Philippi together needs to work out its salvation with fear and trembling, that we're in this thing together. Paul says, hey, I'm not just writing this stuff out of nowhere. I'm not just making this stuff up. I got the brothers that are with me. There's, there's a number of people that, that, that are in this thing with me. And then he says to the churches of Galatia, this is important because oftentimes we think of like just the church in terms of like the larger church, which is true. But to Paul, the, the larger church had groups of people that met in different cities. Like he says to the church at Corinth, he says to the church of God in Corinth. He says to the churches of Galatia. In other words, Paul sees that when the people of God meet and they always meet somewhere, whether it's a house or a building or whatever it is, that when they meet, it's huge. It's important that, that what we do matters. I see these memes all the time on, on social media that says, my church is out in a kayak with a fishing pole. Can I tell you something? That's false. You don't have church in a kayak fishing by yourself. You don't. Church doesn't happen individually. Church happens corporately. It happens when the people of God get together and sing songs and listen to scripture and are changed and are moved and have accountability and have people that pray for them and people that they can talk to. Church is not just something that's no big deal. What we do here matters. It matters. And, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm saddened. I'm saddened by how many things I see in America today where church, ah, we don't need to gather, you know, church isn't a building. It's not, but the church is always gathered in space, whether it be a house, <clears throat> whether it be a synagogue, no matter what, the church is always gathered in sacred space. And what we do matters because what happens in this room? People decide to keep their marriages going. There's people that were dead that have walked in this building that have come to life because of Jesus. To Paul, this matters. He's writing to the people of God in the local communities that are representing Jesus where they live. He then says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. A phrase that many of us probably know because anytime you read Paul, you read this. But this is so pregnant with meaning. It's, it's, it's so profound. He's not writing to non-believers. He's writing to believers. He's writing to people that have been saved by God. And he, he writes to the church in the churches in Galatia. And he says, grace and peace 
from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is unmerited favor. <clears throat> Notice here he doesn't say, you secured the grace, you got the grace, you did something for the grace. No, no. He says, this was something that God did for you as a believer. He gave you unmerited favor. And not only that, he gave you peace. He tore down the walls of hostility between you and him. It wasn't something we did. It was something that he did. See, the unmerited favor of God and the lack of any animosity or separation with God because of what Jesus has done for you and me should be the driving force of our attitudes and emotions and not our circumstances. We should wake up as the most privileged and humbled people in all of the world every single day amazed that the God who spoke billions of galaxies into existence decided to give you and me as his people unmerited favor and peace with him. We should rejoice over that. These are not just flippant words. These aren't just words that are thrown together. They're massively important for you and me. See, we gotta continually remind ourselves that Christianity, it starts with God. Like he loved you and me so much that he sent Jesus to die, as Paul says in Ephesians 5, for his church. He gives us his grace and then he gives us his peace. Like this is profound. The profoundness of an unmerited favor coming from an almighty God and the fact that he took care of the animosity and the separation and the chasm between you and me could not be more profound. And then Paul says, he gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Look, look at, this is, this is the, just a few words say so many things. <clears throat> he gave himself. Have you seen anything yet about what you've done? Have you seen anything else here about what I've done? Have we seen anything about a response? Have we seen anything about, let me tell you what I need? No. Paul wants us to understand the massive amount of divine work towards his people. He gave himself. I think of the passage in Philippians 2 that says that we should have the mind among ourselves as the people of God, the same mind that Jesus had. Jesus, who existed as God and had all the rights and had all the privileges of what it meant to be God, what did he do? He didn't cling. He didn't exploit, he didn't grab, he emptied himself and became a servant so that he could redeem you and me. Listen to the profoundness of what Paul is saying to the Philippian church there. He says, let this mind be yours. How well have we had that mind? during COVID? How well have we had that mind during what's going on in our world? It seems like we like to grab and cling and claim and pull, these are my rights. Paul says, let the mind of Jesus be in all of us who could have clinged to it who could have demanded, but what did he do? He gave it up. Why? Because he gave himself. See, this is, this is divine work 
and initiative. This is, this is almighty God stepping out for you and me. Like we didn't even know it. We weren't even looking for it. We weren't even thinking this was even gonna be a thing. And he steps out and he gave himself, look, look, for, what did he give himself for? Our sins. I know this doesn't go over very well in the world today, that we are sinners before we meet Jesus. I know nobody likes to hear that because most of us like to think, well, I'm pretty good. I'm not as bad as my neighbor. Have you seen my neighbor? Pretty bad. Like compared to him, pretty good. I like what H.C.G. Moore, a wonderful theologian, he said one of the things he used to say was is that you may be on the mountaintop and your buddy in the valley but neither one of you can touch the sun. See, Jesus came to give himself for our sins. We can try to change the Bible. We can try to make it say stuff that it doesn't, but it's very clear here why Jesus came. He came because you and me were in need of rescue. We were broken. We were problemed. We had issues and we all know it. I mean, we may not like the word sin, <clears throat> but we all know that, you know, like if you, if, you, if you do one thing and you blow it one time, you can maybe call that a mistake, right? You do it again, okay, maybe it's a mistake. Some of us have done the same thing hundreds and hundreds of times. I don't think that makes us mistakers. I think that means there's something that's fundamentally not right that needs to be repaired. Jesus gave himself for our sins. Look at this, to deliver you and me. There is power in the gospel. There is power in the transformational nature of what Jesus does in our hearts, in our lives, when we say, I want to follow you. It's the greatest news in the world. There's transformation. The, it, Jesus doesn't just meet us where we are, which he does, but he doesn't leave us where we are. I love what one theologian says. He goes, you may not be any better than your neighbor as a Christian, but you were, you're better than you were before you met Jesus. Jesus changes lives, delivers us from the present evil age. Some of us need to download that a little bit. Need to, need to take a moment and go, whoa, man. Yes, he's put his spirit within us. He's delivered us from this present evil age. He gave himself for our sins to do this. And this is what's great. Richard B. Hayes says this, <clears throat> Jesus' death does not simply procure the forgiveness of sins, as great as that would be. Rather, it transposes us into an entirely new reality by liberating us from the power of the present evil age. That's profound. But that's why we, we teach as Christians that, hey, you can know Jesus and he can make a difference in your life. It's called your testimony. It's called, it's called the testimony of, hey, this is what I was and this is what God has done. That God has changed my life. He's made a difference in my life. This isn't, this isn't just something that we ascribe to and hope that it's true. This is something that we believe in, in a person and it changes our lives. And then he says, according, this is really profound, according to the will of our God and Father. A lot of people have a problem. They don't understand how God can be completely sovereign and people then can also make choices. And what we do in theology is we argue this stuff. And if you get around the room, you'll be people argue this stuff all day long. Can I give you a little secret as somebody who they actually pay to teach theology? Can I tell you a little secret? Nobody fully understands the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of people. Nobody does. So when they tell you that they do, look at them and say, you don't. You don't. We don't understand. What I can tell you though, is that Paul says, hey, all the stuff that went on, the law and, and the sacrifices and, and the death of Jesus and all, all the things that have happened, 
to get us to where we are, for Jesus to have given himself to deliver us from this present evil age. Yes, every single bit of it was exactly the way God wanted it to happen. You go, well, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're not gonna fully understand. We're dealing with God here. You think we're gonna just sort of master God? I always say, if you think you have God figured out, what you have in your hands is an idol because God's a lot bigger than you and me. He's a lot more profound than you and me. And so think about this for a second. What does this mean for us? I put me, I typically use us and we, because I never want anybody to think that I'm preaching at you, because I'm not. But I do wanna take this and make this personal. What does this mean for me? What would this look like in my life if this is in fact true? If God has given me that grace, if God has given me that peace, if God has worked in my life and delivered me in all of these things, what would that look like? How would that shake out? And then listen to what Paul says, to whom be the glory forever and ever, amen. Listen to me, hear me. All good doctrine, all good theology, if it is good doctrine and if it is good theology, will always lead us to worship. It always does. Doctrine leads to doxology. Understanding what God has done leads to worship, which is exactly what he says here. To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. A couple of things here to think about, some take homes, and then we're gonna sing a song. First of all, why does God deserve our worship and praise. You know, I often, I often think to myself when I come in to, to grace, when we're meeting, I, I try to come through that door in the middle of a worship set periodically just to uh, see what's going on. And I often ask myself the question, if I were a non-Christian who didn't believe in God at all, when I come in and watch the people sing and I watch them worship, would I believe that they really thought there was something else besides themselves? And oftentimes I wonder if we understand why worship and praise is so important. You know, why does God deserve our worship and praise? Well, he took the initiative to rescue you and me. I like to boat. I can't imagine being out 40 or 50 miles offshore and a boat sinking with my kids. And, and maybe not, and we do, we have all the life jackets and all that stuff, but <clears throat> let's assume that we didn't. And, and <clears throat> the life jackets didn't fit and they were half waterlogged and we were drowning. And all of a sudden a boat came up and lifted us up. Do, do, do you think that we would be like, thanks, appreciate it. I don't feel moved. No, we, we would be ecstatic. The Bible doesn't say we were floating in the water almost ready to drown. Ephesians 2 says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But God, rich in mercy, with the great love with which he loved us, made us alive. See, why? because he took the initiative to rescue you and me. Not only that, he gave himself for our sins. Like, just think about that for a moment. He gave himself for our sins. He's once and for all times delivered us. He's gonna continue to complete the work that he began in you until the day that he comes back, Paul says in Philippians 1.6. Like, he's delivered us. Why does he deserve our worship and praise? Well, because he extended grace when we didn't deserve it and gave us peace, we didn't earn. He deserves all of the worship and all of the praise that we could ever give him. And then the last thing that I wanna deal with and go home and think about this over the weekend is <clears throat> we need to make sure we know who our salvation is based on. One of the things that we're gonna come back and forth in, in this epistle over and over again is the idea of the gospel, is what does the gospel mean? What does it mean for you and me? And what does it mean to truly know the one who gave himself for us? 
We need to make sure that we know who our salvation is based on. It's not based on a what, it's based on a who. It's based on a relationship with Jesus. And this changes everything because this helps us to remember that we aren't somehow noble people who can sort of do good and then merit our salvation. Like this is not the way it works. We, we don't stand before God one day and say, well, I did this and I did that. And I can't tell you how many times that I've sat down with people who have been to church and, and, and have gone to church and have attended church. And I sit down and say, okay, let me ask you a question. If you had to stand before God tonight, why, why would he say, come in? Well, you know, I mean, I've, I've lived a pretty good life. You know, I mean, I, you know, I, I attended church. I, I, don't, I don't mean to be rude or snarky, but that's, a, eh, that's not the right answer. The right answer is that, Lord, the only reason that I can come in is because I believe that your son Jesus died on a cross for my sins and he rose again on the third day so that I could have everlasting life. The only reason I can come in is because of what Jesus did for me. That's the answer. It keeps us from looking down on others that sin differently than we do. I wanna get a shirt that says, don't judge me because I sin differently than you. You know, I mean, in, in, in being reminded of what Jesus has done for you and me helps us to understand that we can't make ourselves comfortable by thinking we're better than others. That doesn't work. You know, when we understand who saved us, we can actually take criticism as, hey, they may be right rather than being defensive. It changes everything when we realize our salvation is based on a person, not on us. And we learn seeing our weakness and finding our life in Christ is better than seeing ourselves strong in and of ourselves. You know, I wanna to extend to you and to those <clears throat> online. I, I wanna extend a moment to just to rediscover, to take a moment and, and rediscover what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. To take a moment and to really think again what he's done for you and me. For some of you, that may be the first time for some of you, you may be going, well, you know, I've been to church and never really heard it like this. I never, okay, man, this, is this really, could, this sounds great. Like Jesus really loves me. Yeah, all those things are true. And I want you to make that decision if you've not. But I suspect for many in the room and many online that we would probably raise our hand and say, I, I believe. But, but I'd like for us to, to rethink what that means. What it means for God to be who he says he is for you and me, what it means for you and me that he gave himself for our sins, that he extended grace and peace, that he took all of our pieces and put them back because of his heart towards you and me. Would you bow your heads for a second? Father, I just wanna take a moment here and just have a moment of honesty, authenticity, just brutal honesty. Lord, it's so easy to get caught up in church, to sing the songs, to do the things, to attend the different <clears throat> activities. None of them are bad within themselves, but it's so easy in all of these moments to somehow forget what you've done for us. And for sometimes it goes dry and sometimes it doesn't feel as real as it did. In many ways, oftentimes we lose our first love for you. I'm asking for your glory and for your glory alone that you would ignite within us a newness of appreciation and humbleness for what you've done for us. Lord, we did not deserve what you've done for us. We did not merit it. You gave us grace and peace. You've been the defender of our heart. You picked up all of our pieces. And Lord, we just wanna say thanks. And we wanna walk out of here this weekend. We wanna tune out this weekend 
realizing what you've done for us and what that means in our response to you and in our response to the world. And Father, I pray that as we sing this last song, I pray that we would all have just a moment of clarity and a moment, Lord, of just focus on how grand, how magnificent your salvation is towards us and that we would worship you as a response. I pray that you would continue to lead, guide, and direct all of us and watch over us in Christ Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Would you stand with us and let's sing one final song.
Okay, Grace family, that's all for today. We hope that something from today's service has spoken to you. If there's anything that we can do to help you in your walk with Christ, if you would like specific prayer, if you need to talk to someone on staff, or if you just want to share how this ministry has impacted you, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can either send us an email to grace at gracesarasota.com, or you can call the phone number that's on the screen and in the chat. And to all of you tuning in as a new guest, don't forget that you can either visit gracesarasota.com and click the I'm new button, or you can text new guest SRQ with no spaces to 97000. Either way, you'll be able to fill out our digital connect card and receive a free gift from our church. And you'll also be able to plan a future visit to either our Lakewood Ranch campus or our Bee Ridge campus right here in Sarasota, Florida. All that being said, it's now time for all of us to go out and be those intentional neighbors that God is calling us to be. As always, just know that we love you, that we're praying for you. Stay safe, and thanks again for joining us here at Grace, where everyone is welcome.